our plan for today was to wrap up our sermon series on the book of Genesis by talking about the story of Joseph. But God has interrupted those plans. Don't you hate it when that happens? God, who do you think you are? Oh, I guess if you're God, you get to interrupt, right? This has been a week of unexpected interruptions. Pastor Vivian got a call that her elder brother in Washington, D.C. was having a medical emergency and had to rush back there to, to help him, and thankfully she's back with us today. And Pastor Chris, uh, throughout the, you have at least one fan here in the second <laughs> row, <laughs> and Pastor Chris has... Uh, uh, been struggling with a bad case of asthma and bronchitis this week. He's now recovering from that and is doing much better. And, and our operations minister, Spencer James, injured his back and has literally been on his back all week. And so when you see any of those three today, be extra nice to them. You can be as mean as you want to Pastor Jason and to Pastor David and maybe even me, but when you see the other three, be extra nice to them today. Isn't that how it is in life? You just never know what's around the corner, what surprise is waiting for you. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Jesus said, John 3, 8, the spirit blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. This is a play on words. The Greek word for spirit is also the Greek word for wind. So Jesus is comparing how the spirit works in our life to how the wind blows. In effect, he's saying, like the wind blows, so too the spirit sweeps through our life in mysterious ways, carrying us where it will, and we have to be prepared to go with the flow. In his writings, uh, Val Farmer tells us that the Chinese word for crisis is comprised by combining two other Chinese words, the Chinese character for dangerous wind and the character for opportunity. So that the Chinese word for crisis literally means opportunity riding the dangerous wind. When you find yourself in time of crisis, you can be fretful and resistant, or you can catch the wave and ride it and open yourself to new possibilities. That's what I want to talk to us about today. I want to talk to us about crisis would be too strong of a word, but I want to talk to us about a challenge that we're facing as a church community and a wonderful opportunity that God has laid before us to address that challenge and end up in an even better place, opportunity, riding the dangerous wind. So in the first half of today's sermon, I want to remind us a little bit about who we are as a church, what God has raised us up to be. And then in the second half of the sermon, I want to share with you the the challenge and the opportunity before us that's so time-sensitive, it merited interrupting, interrupting our regularly scheduled programming. Let's start with a prayer. Breath of God, breathe. Wind of God, blow. Carry us where you will, opening us to new possibilities giving us a vision that's as big as your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At the outset of the book of Revelation, God gives John a fascinating vision. John, or excuse me, Revelation 1.12. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and on turning... I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man, Jesus, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. So you've got the picture, right? 
Jesus is standing someplace in heaven in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. What do these candlesticks represent? Verse 20 tells us the seven lampstands are the seven churches, i.e. the seven churches to whom John was writing the book of Revelation, all of which suggests that there is some place in heaven Maybe it's Jesus' meditation room, I imagine. Some place in heaven that is filled with golden candlesticks, one candlestick for each church in existence, so that as Jesus goes to that place, he sees and is reminded of each church, their strengths and weaknesses, their challenges and possibilities, each one precious, each one unique, all of which causes me to wonder when Jesus gazes upon the candlestick that represents Life Journey Church in his meditation room, what does he see? What does he think about? After all, God knows there are enough churches in this world. Jesus has churches running out of his ears. So why on earth did Jesus need to raise up yet another church, this church that we call Life Journey? If you were to drive down uh, Grove Street in Toledo, Ohio, you would notice beautiful tall oak trees on both sides of the road, well manicured lawns, and lots of churches. In fact, at one point, there are three churches in a row, one right next to another, each architecturally different, but each bearing a similar name. First Community Church, Second Community Church, Third Community Church. The three pastors of those churches happened to cross paths on the sidewalk out front one day. The one said to the other, maybe we should define what we mean by community. So many churches. First Baptist Church, Second Presbyterian Church, Third United Methodist Church, Fourth Church of the Holy Ghost, on fire, apostolic, and on and on we could go with all of the churches that already exist here in central Indiana. Why on earth did Jesus need to raise up this congregation that we call Life Journey Church? At the network gathering of churches we hosted here at Life Journey last weekend, Pastor David shared with us a concept developed by the Center for Ethical Leadership that is called Gracious Space. I found myself, as he explained that concept, I found myself thinking, aha, that's it. That's why God has raised up this church to specialize in creating gracious space so that we, soaking that in in this place, can then go out of here and ourselves create gracious space in our homes, in our workplace, with the people that we encounter. What does gracious space? space look like? Jesus shows us in our gospel passage today, Luke chapter 7. Picture it in your mind's eye. It's a gathering of religious people. Simon the Pharisee has invited a bunch of his Pharisee friends for a fellowship dinner. The customs being what they were at the time, that means it was all men men of God, who were gathering here for this fellowship meal, and Jesus was invited to be their special guest. Everything was going swimmingly. There was no cursing. There was no excess drinking. It was just good spiritual conversation because, after all, these were good men, men of God. Everything was going swimmingly until someone who was other invaded their space. Someone who was different. For starters, she was a woman. What did this woman think she was doing crashing this party of godly men? Not just that. She was a woman who carried a label that had been hung on her by the culture at the time. Sinner. We're told in Luke chapter 7 verse 37, a woman in the city who was a sinner. Having learned that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, 
brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She had heard that Jesus was, was gathering at this place, and she had learned enough about Jesus to know that if Jesus was in this place, she figured she too would be certainly welcome because that's how Jesus was. Jesus welcomed everyone into his presence. All are welcome. And so she just assumed that people who would want to be in the company of Jesus would be like Jesus, which unfortunately is often not the case. And so unassuming, she comes into this space over flowing with gratitude that she wants to express to Jesus because apparently she, her life was being transformed by the presence and the teachings of Jesus. So she brings this expensive alabaster jar with her that she breaks open and pours the expensive ointment over Jesus' feet, her way of saying, thank you, thank you for the incredible work that you are doing in my life, for the grace that I have found in you. She weeps for joy. Her tears bathe his feet. She dries his feet with her hair. She kisses his feet. And Jesus welcomes her in that place. But the men of God are not amused. Simon says, no pun intended, <laughs> Simon says, Put your hands on your head. No, no. <laughs> Simon the Pharisee says, verse 39, if this man, Jesus, were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. So you see what's happening now, right? It's not just this woman who was unwelcome in their presence, but anyone who dared to welcome this woman was now also unwelcome, including Jesus. To make a long story short, Jesus patiently, through a story, explained to Simon that we are all sinners, that we all need grace and forgiveness, and that this woman was so far ahead of him, spiritually speaking, it wasn't even funny. Jesus defended her right to be in that space. How do you think she felt when Jesus Christ stood up for her and said she deserves to be here? She spiritually leaps and bounds beyond any of... How do you think she felt when others met her with hostility? He, with welcome, he defended her. He encouraged her. He was glad that she was in that space. That's what it looks like to create gracious space. We are called to be the kind of church that creates gracious space. Like Jesus before us, too many churches in the world today are becoming too much like that gathering of Pharisees in our gospel passage, places of exclusivity, places that, that try to fit everybody, force everybody into the same mold, places that cultivate attitudes of spiritual superiority. One afternoon, one afternoon, uh, a dad was looking out the kitchen window. He saw his son, Johnny, was out in the backyard playing church with the family cat as his congregation. Johnny was preaching a sermon to the cat, and the cat was just sort of sitting there looking at him, and dad smiles and, and thinks to himself, oh, that's, that's so cute. Five minutes later, he hears loud meowing and hissing, rushes back to the window, looks out, and sees that little Johnny is about to baptize the cat in a tub of water. Dad throws open the window and calls out, Johnny, stop that. That cat hates water. Johnny says, as he shrugs, he should have thought of that before he joined my church. <laughs> Too many churches in the world today are like that. Coercive. Rigid, one size fits all, get with the program or get out. We don't need your kind here. But Jesus was different. He specialized in creating gracious space. 
the Center for Ethical Leadership, which, by the way, is a secular organization that's devoted to trying to help make workplaces better. But the Center for Ethical Leadership says that the chief characteristics of gracious space are, number one, welcome. All are welcome. Number two, compassion. Number three, humor. That's why I torment you with my bad <laughs> jokes. It's good for you. You know, it's true, though, isn't it, that any time people gather where there is a gracious spirit there is a good sense of humor in that place number four humility and curiosity an attitude that that is a continuing quest for learning instead of an attitude that says i've already got all the answers figured out and i don't need nothing else number five inclusion of the stranger which they define as anyone who who presents as other, as different in a particular space. And number six, deep listening so that we can learn from each other. These are the characteristics of gracious space, and we are called to be that kind of church. We are called to be a Luke 7 church because that's what people need. People need safe space to find God in their lives. They don't need to go to the kind of place that's going to make them feel worse when they go out than when they came in to the place. They need comfort, encouragement. They need grace. They need the good news of Jesus Christ. We are called to be that kind of church. I wish you could have been with me uh, Wednesday night when I hosted our Newcomers Welcome Reception here at the church. Eight newcomers gathered last Wednesday night, and when we got to the part of the conversation where I asked them to share, why is it that you're exploring this church? As they began to share their thoughts, my heart melted. One of them said, you know, I've never been much of a church person, but when I walk into this place, I feel something wonderful, and it makes me start to tear up. When we're worshiping, she said, when you're preaching, I just start to tear up. Oh, she said, there it goes now, (laughs) and she started to tear up. I'm sorry, she said, "but, but I want to explore that. I want to know what that is, this wonderful presence that I'm feeling. That's beautiful. That's what gracious space looks like. Another newcomer who was there said, well, I I just came because my friend wanted to come and visit the church, and she was nervous to come alone. So I said I would come along, and she explained that she was kind of new to life in church. She said, so I just came along with my friend to help her out. She said, but I got here, and I didn't fall asleep. (laughs) That's what she actually said. She said, I actually enjoyed it. And then she went on to say her exact words, there's just a spirit of love that you feel when you walk into this place. A third newcomer who was there said, when I was a child, a teenager, a young adult, I attended church often. I went because I was supposed to. But she said, I'm at the point in my life now where I want my spirituality to be something I want and not something I have to do. She stumbled across this church, and she told us, she said, every Sunday since, I have gotten up on a Sunday morning, and I found myself thinking, I want to be there. She went on to say, there is this spirit of love in this place that you can just feel. That's what gracious space is looks like and it's beautiful we come to this place to absorb the grace that is here so that we can then turn around and take that grace out into the world and share it at home and in our workplaces and with others that we encounter you're probably familiar with the concept that that a a mobile phone a, a cell phone can become a hot spot i don't understand exactly the the mechanics of how all of that works but you can set up your phone so that it, it's a, a mobile hotspot that taps into the power of the internet and sends out Wi-Fi signals that any other laptop, 
tablet or gaming console that is nearby can, can then t also tap in through that to the power of the internet. We are called to be living, breathing, mobile uh, uh, mobile hot spots carrying with us the power of grace and sharing that with all who come in to our presence. We absorb more and more of Jesus in this place so that we can go out there and be more and more like Jesus. Amen. On Tuesday, September 11, 2001, Ruth Center and her husband had made reservations to have dinner that evening at a, a new family-owned restaurant in town, a Middle Eastern restaurant owned by an Arab family. She, Ruth, had experienced a great lunch at the restaurant, authentic Middle Eastern food. She knew her husband would love it, so she'd made the reservations. They were going to go there that night so that he could be introduced to it, but of course, September 11, 2001 is the day that the World Trade Towers fell. And during the course of that afternoon, Ruth says, I found myself thinking, I don't want to go to that place. I don't want to go to that place and patronize those people. Then she said, there was something inside her that said, no, you will go there. The wind of the Spirit blowing her. So they, they kept those reservations. They showed up there that evening. They were the only patrons in the entire restaurant that night. A little boy came out and took their order. They could see the young mother preparing their meal through the open door into the kitchen with an infant sleeping on a table nearby. They enjoyed a wonderful meal, paid their bill, left a tip, got up to leave the restaurant. But just as they got to the door of the restaurant, Ruth's husband stopped. He was feeling something. He was sensing something. The wind of the Spirit turned him around and drove him back to the table where he opened his wallet and left an extra large tip. The little boy, seeing this, was old enough to understand the gesture. The little boy smiled. The mother mouthed the words, thank you. That's what it looks like to create gracious space. We are called to that. This church has been raised up to be and to do that. It's beautiful. It's a high holy calling, desperately needed. There are many people in this world who will never find God in their life without a church like this one. We are called to be a place that creates gracious space. But it's not an easy calling. Because there aren't very many powerful or well-off people who are going to choose to worship in a spiritual community that actually welcomes the other. And that brings us to the challenge part that I alluded to at the start of today's sermon. It's not easy being a church that specializes in creating grace, gracious space for others. To be a community of grace, of course, we have to have a place where we can gather all churches do we have to have a, a physical place where we can come together as a community this physical space in which we meet has blessed us and served us well since we purchased it through a series of miracles way back in 2001 this place has served us well but over the course of time it's accumulated a whole lot of significant deferred maintenance we would always rather put our money into ministry we always have we always will we are not here to serve a church building the church building is here to serve us but we're getting to the point with some of this deferred maintenance where it feels like the physical space in which we're meeting is starting to be a hindrance to our ministry i'm not talking about this beautiful room and social hall where we sit but have you noticed some of the serious maintenance issues we've got going on on the outside of our building we come here every week and so we can be oblivious to it but but significant capital projects that we've just not had the money to invest in. For example, have you looked recently at the west end of our building? It's clad, of course, in wood siding. About a quarter of our building is wood siding. The siding on this building is original. It's what they call T1. 
111, an old kind of wood siding that got recalled for being defective, but we've been nursing it along through the years and patching it here and there, as you can see. But it isn't going to give us much more time. It's warping, it's coming loose, it's uh, rotting, and they're actual, you, if you look close, you can see the holes that are developing. We've actually started to get some critters in the attic that we can hear running around above us when we're sitting in our offices. We got a bird uh, that actually made it through the ceiling and into the offices a couple of months ago. Spencer and I were chasing it around, trying to chase it out. We ended up chasing it into Pastor Jason's office. And, <laughs> To say he was not amused would be an understatement. But So we've got that going on. And on top of that, have you noticed that our gutters are pulling away in many parts of the building? We keep reaffixing them, but they won't hold because the board behind them is starting to rot away. On top of that, have you noticed our main parking lot out here, which is riddled with what are called alligator cracks? that feed potholes in the winter and weeds in the summer. Uh, the parking lot out here this summer had so many weeds in it, I was tempted to have our lawn crew start mowing the parking <laughs> lot. It's a terrible eyesore, but worse yet, that then feeds and creates potholes that develop in the winter, which become a trip and fall hazard, a liability, a hazard to people tripping. And we've got that going on that we've been putting off for years and years because it's so expensive. And on top of that, if you've ever used the restrooms in this church, you know how cramped they are. If you're ever in our restrooms with two or more people in there at the same time, it starts to feel very claustrophobic, doesn't it? Jesus said, wherever two or three gather in my name, <laughs> there am I in the midst of them. Well, when two or three people are in our restrooms, there ain't no room for Jesus in there. I can tell you that. These are the restrooms that are original to the building. They are not meant for the capacity that we now use the building for. We frequently have lines at the women's room during periods of peak capacity. And though they're technically handicap accessible, they're very, very tight. So we've got all of these deferred maintenance issues going on. Jeff, you may say, why don't you deal with them? One word, cost. What would you guess it would cost if we tackled those three projects? Resurfacing the parking lot, siding, and uh, expanded code-compliant public restrooms. What do you think it would cost? 150. 150. I hear a bit of 150. 250. $300,000. And we've got the bids to prove it. 95000 for the resurfacing of the parking lot. 46000 for new siding and gutters and so forth on a building this size. And to get a code-compliant public restroom that complies with all the things you have to do to have a public building, $157,000. Total that up, it's $300,000. Yikes, we don't have that kind of money. What are we going to do? Crisis, crisis, danger, danger. Will Robinson, any old enough to remember that TV show? No. <laughs> right. <laughs> Add to that, as if it weren't enough, another problem. Our existing mortgage loan on this building is due to renew in December. The way church loans are structured, they renew every five years. When we renewed our church loan last time, it was no problem, but bank lending standards have tightened greatly since then, and banks don't particularly like to lend to churches because they're nonprofits. And so all year long, I have been worrying myself sick. Oh no, when we renew, the, go to renew this loan in December, what's going to happen if the bank won't renew our loan? We've we started out with a mortgage of 790000 Over the years, we've paid it down patiently to 344000 but we've got to renew and continue paying that 344. dollars If the bank were to say no go, where would we come up with $344,000? If you haven't guessed, I'm kind of a worrier. It's one of my spiritual gifts to worry. One of my favorite cartoons, maybe you've seen it before, it shows two bats hanging upside down from a tree limb. Have you seen it before? And one bat's talking to the other, and the, the bat on the left says to the bat on the right, he says, do you know what I worry about most about growing old? The bat on the right side says, no, what is it? The bat on the left says, incontinence. Because <laughs> think about it, if you're hanging upside down all the time, you know, incontinence can be a real problem, right? I am like the bat on the left here. I tend to worry, 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 worry. And I've been worried sick. What will happen if we can't renew this loan? This is what you call crisis. But remember, 
crisis is opportunity riding on the dangerous wind. And as we sing here often at Life Journey, our God is a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkest night. And God has made a way for us. Amen. By the way, are you getting too warm in here? Do we need a little circulation? Just a little bit. Don't overcorrect. Just a degree down will help us get a little circulation in here. With Spencer not here today, he's not tending to our, uh, to our thermostats in here. So God has made a way for us. We've been in dialogue with various banks, and one of the banks, a good, strong bank, has said, sure, we would be happy to renew your existing loan at a very good interest rate, 5.25%, which for non-residential loans in this environment is a steal. Other commercial lenders have told me we can't even touch that. It's their prime rate for their best. Uh, they classify churches as commercial uh, com companies. They're willing to renew that loan for us, and they're also willing to add two to $300,000 to that for the capital improvements that we need to make at a great interest rate and with a 15 or 20 year amortization period, which means that the current level of mortgage payments we're making, it won't go up, it will continue level so that we can get all of that for what we are now paying per month on our mortgage. That is one of those, wow, thank you, God, kind of moments. But there is a catch. The catch is this. For that extra two to, uh, to $300,000 uh, to, uh, to be uh, lent to us for those capital improvements, they want us by the end of this year to hit two benchmarks that they have set for us. The first benchmark is financial. They're saying, we want your total giving for 2018 to hit or exceed 490000 If you crunch the numbers on that, that means that to hit that target, we need to increase our weekly giving by about $650 a week. The second condition is attendance. They want us to have average attendance for the year of at least 281 people because they understand that attendance is a key sign of commitment and, and, and a key sign of a thriving church. So to reach that goal of average attendance for the year of 281, we need as many as possible 300 plus Sundays in November and December. So here's the ask part. And by the way, those of you who are new to our church, I apologize for talking about church business today, but I hope you understand that for our congregation, this is critically important. So here's the ask. Can you help with either or both of those conditions? On the financial goal front, the extra 650 a week, one way to look at it is to say we need 65 units of $10 per week additional giving. Could you take on one of those $10 units? If you're currently a regular giver to the church, are you at a place where you could add a little bit? If you're not yet a regular giver to our church, but you believe in what God's doing here, what a great time to join us in becoming a regular giver. Could you pick up a $10 a week unit? Some could pick up five of those units. There are a few who could pick up 10 to 15 of those units. We have people who are already doing something like that. If you feel called to that, at the end of the sermon, during the reflection moment, our ushers are going to distribute handouts that have some of the information I've shared on the front side and then a response form on the back side. And if you are so called, you can fill out that form and return it at the display out by the stained glass window where the, the table is set up there. There are pins at the table there for you. And as you drop your form into the box there, you, you saw that uh, placard there with all the $10 per week post-it notes on that picture. As you put your form in, feel free to peel off from that picture the number of $10 units that close, most closely corresponds to what you're feeling called to do. And, it, and behind it, slowly, we're revealing a mystery picture with a mystery message that's kind of like, any of you like to watch Wheel of Fortune, it's kind of Wheel of Fortune-like. So if you're into that, peel off your $10 per uh, post-it note. For the other goal, the attendance goal, you've seen we've set up a second station out here called the Gift of Our Presence. 
Are you someone who could say, I am committing to be here every Sunday in November and December for two months, except when I'm sick or out of town? If so, fill out that part of the response form. Or if you can't do that, let's say you're somebody who typically comes once a month. Can you be here three times over the next, uh, each month, over the next two months, or two times? If so, that would help greatly. Just fill out that form, and then we're inviting you to celebrate that by writing your name on the wall, on the north wall here, nowhere else, on the north wall here, where the display is. You've been wanting to write on the wall since you were three years old and not get scolded. This is your chance to just write your name on the wall. And while you're at it, if there's someone you can invite to come who would be blessed by this church, invite that person and write that person's first name or first and second name on the wall as we celebrate coming together to make this happen. Think of it by simply attending here on a Sunday morning. You can come in here on a Sunday morning, not talk to a single other person, not do a single other thing, and simply by the gift of your presence, you will be helping Jesus accomplish more of what he wants to do through a church like this. So, if you want to sit on a better throne in the restrooms here at Life Journey, then you need to get your behindy in one of the thrones here in the sanctuary on Sunday. This is just a two-month ask, but if you come almost every Sunday for two months, you might just find the extra grace you're receiving in your life makes it worthwhile, and you just might continue it. Let me close with this. A couple months ago, I was... Uh, sitting down and talking to somebody who's relatively new to our church who was telling me about his spiritual journey. He told me how he had been raised in a family that founded a church. So the church was founded by his extended family and largely populated by his extended family. It was a fundamentalist church, rather rigid and quite legalistic. He says, I I got some really good things from it. But in his teen years, he began to think that he might be gay. And as he explored that, oh boy, his church family turned on him big time. Condemnation, judgment, you're going to hell, the threat, the terror of hell always looming over him. Ultimately, as he continued to grow in his self-awareness, not because of their pressure, but just his growing self-awareness, he concluded he wasn't gay. But he had seen enough of church to last a lifetime. Who wants to gather on a Sunday with a place that feels like those, that gathering of Pharisees in Luke chapter 7? So he was done with church. He quit. But over time, he's begun to really miss God in his life and want to reconnect, but this time in a healthier way. He stumbled across this church. Or maybe I should say the wind of the Spirit blew him into this place. He's really digging in now, connecting, reconnecting to God, renewing his soul, learning the God of love that Jesus came to reveal. That's what we're about. What we are called to do here is so important. There are many people who will never find God in their lives without a church like this one. So this morning, I want to invite you to be an active part of what Jesus is trying to do in this world. Be part of something bigger than yourself. Be an active part of what Jesus wants to do through this candlestick church, this cutting-edge, innovative Luke 7 church. If we pull together, we can do this. With the wind of the Spirit at our back, we can do this. Because we serve a God who is a way-maker Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkest night. This time I want to invite the ushers, if during our moment of reflection, if you'll please distribute those handouts, the printed front and back. The response, if you feel so moved, is on the back. There are pens at the table out in the social hall. Thanks be to God for this great opportunity. Amen.